So hi, welcome. Thank you. I'm Debbie Rubenstein, and it's February 26th, 2024. Uh, and I'm here with you today to talk about the Living Archives. Can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Jadon Marshall. I'm the president and CEO of WFAE, the NPR station here in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's great. Would you describe yourself? I am an African-American woman. I'm 5'6", I'm pleasantly plump, and I am a member, also a member of the Gullah Geechee Nation. And for those who don't know, the Gullah Geechee are descendants of West African people who were born, born here as slaves, and we recreated culture. And so from the coastal areas of North Carolina, down through South Carolina and Georgia, and all the way down to Florida, we still populate those areas. And a lot of African-American culture in this country is derived out of the Gullah Geechee culture. Oh, that's really great. That's, that's really delightful. Can you tell me where home is then for you? Home is Charleston, South Carolina, specifically um, a town called Hollywood, South Carolina, which is not what you think of when you hear Hollywood. It's a very rural area. Um, again, it is a lot of Gullah descendants live in that area. It's very is rural. Is it actually on one of the barrier islands? It's inland. Okay. It's inland. So it's surrounded by the islands, but inland. Okay. And, and a lot of the people from the islands all go to school with the folks in that area. Oh, that's great. I know I was reading something about you before this and uh, talked about how you, uh, you, did you move there or you just came to visit? So I'm, I moved there. So um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. That's where my mother was born and my father was born. But three of my four grandparents are from the low country of South Carolina, specifically the Charleston, Berkeley County areas. Um, and so when, my, when I was seven years old, my grandparents retired back to that area and we followed. And so I grew up in Hollywood. Um, it's the place that I call home. It's the place I feel at home in the world. So, and my mother still lives there. Oh, that's nice. Do you have other relatives as well who are still there? We have a huge extended family. Um, way more people. <laughs> as I get older and discover and do more geneal genealogy, a lot of my play cousins, which mm -hmm. is a very um, prominent thing in the African-American community to have play cousins, turns out they were actually my real cousins, <laughs> biologically. Um, and so I have a huge extended family that still exists in that area. Oh, that's great. Uh, now, when the pandemic came to town, uh, you were living here in Charlotte. Okay? Yes. How long had you been here at that point? I came back to Charlotte in 2017. So and did you come back to work for WFA? Yes, I did. And was that as chief content officer? That was as, yes, yes, chief content officer. What is chief content officer? Really, it's the person who's ultimately responsible for storytelling and programming for the station. So everything you hear on air, all of the work that our reporters do, a lot of the live events that we were having came out of that, that team that was run by the chief content officer. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, how did that, I mean, that work is extensive. So do you remember at all when you first started to hear about COVID and do you remember your thoughts? So interestingly enough, I actually think I was one of the first people to have COVID. So I was never diagnosed, but the a month before it was announced, I had been sick for about a month, the worst illness that I had ever experienced, so much so that my family wouldn't come in my room. You know, they were sliding food yeah. through the door um, because I was that ill. And so I knew there was something because then I was hearing of other illnesses. My uncle actually got, he was in New York. He actually became really ill and ultimately succumbed. And right after that, we heard about COVID. And so um, when we first heard about it, we didn't know what it was, right? We've had other things happen in, around the world, like Ebola, that were devastating. You know, like the bird flu when, you know, avian flus that have happened in mean, earlier decades where you see entire populations affected and you see the mortality rates increase very rapidly. And so we didn't know if it was going to be that and contained to a place, but then COVID just kind of broke through anything we saw before. And so it started moving. And I remember when it landed in this country, you know, out on the West Coast, and we thought, well, maybe it'll stay there, right? Maybe they'll get their hands around it now that it's here and they'll, you know, do some lockdowns and we'll get it under control. But it wasn't like anything that I can recall in my lifetime. Yeah. 
And you still had family in New York, it sounds like, mm-hmm. as well. And they had, they had a pretty significant yeah. early experience with COVID. Yeah, my... Um, one of my cousins is a nurse and my other cousin worked in a nursing home. And so they very early on were seeing devastating losses. You know, I was afraid for them because they had to go into the workplace and deal with, you know, a lot of death, a lot of illness. And they had small, they had young children, not small children, but to navigate all of that and be concerned about your own safety. And there was a lot of misinformation early on. Um, Early on, there were rumors out there that black people were less affected. And, you know, so there was a lot of social media saying, don't take the vaccinations once vaccinations were becoming available. Um, But we know through the journalism and through the scientific studies that people of color were being disproportionately affected, right? So despite what was out on social media, we could see the impact that was happening in communities of color. And so navigating all of that and the anxiety and all of the unknowns around that was really difficult. Well, did you feel, so you had COVID early, you had relatives in parts of the country where they experienced it first. Did that, when you came back here in your professional capacity and we're talking about this thing and it's coming or it's here and it's covered, what was the response like? Did people hear you? Did they believe you? So we, so when I was sick, we didn't have a name for it. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know enough to know that this is related until we started to get into it and the symptoms were all the same symptoms. So, so it was already here by the time I could really say, well, wait a minute, you know, that feels very familiar to what, what I experienced. Um, all we knew is that people would need to isolate just based on what was happening elsewhere in the country and the guidance that was already out there. We knew that that was going to happen here in Charlotte. And our goal was one, how do we continue to serve the station, the the community rather, because unlike a lot of media companies, there's a physical nature to what we do that requires us to come into a facility because we're broadcasting. And so our first goal was how do we stay on air you know, so that we can give people the information that they need. And how can we make as many people as possible remote? So our reporters, for example, didn't necessarily need to come into the studio because we had done things remotely in other circumstances, right? Not to that scale, but we had to think through very quickly, how do we get equipment into everybody's home so that they could do their jobs effectively from home and so that we could minimize who was coming into the building and keep as many people as safe as possible. And I'm really proud because our engineer, Joby Sprinkle, and others really stepped up and rallied to that cause and and got people all of the equipment so that they could be safe when they had to go out into the field, we got boom mics. So right now I'm sitting next to a very short mic that's on a very short stand on a table. And so we had these mics with like these six foot poles, right? So you could stand at a distance, you could be masked, you could still do interviews, but that everybody could be safe. And then we had, you know, boxes put in people's homes so that they could then do all of their audio recording and broadcasting remotely. So it was a quick transition for the team. And and again, they did a remarkable job. WFAE did not miss one day being on air throughout this pandemic. And we were by and large able to keep illness to a minimum within the organization. There there were no super spreader events during that time. Was it the lockdown that helped you make the decision to convert? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I I remember, I can't remember the exact date, but that March when they, you know, we were in one week talking about what if, you know, and then before we knew it, we had a date where, you know, there was a state of emergency and everybody needed to go home. Um, And so that required us thinking on the fly, doing a lot of this. Like, it's not like we had a long prep time to get ready for this. It was like, what is this thing? And now it's here and we have to adjust. There was, it was very confusing for many people at the beginning. There was not a lot of information and then there was a lot of contradictory information. What kind of challenges did that present you as journalists? For us, we really tried to stay close to the science and, and the scientists and the doctors, right? So we took a very conservative role of sharing what we needed to share when we needed to share it. 
And to the extent that we knew what the what fact from fiction was, we shared that as well. We asked a lot of questions. We asked questions of our community, what they needed to know. Um, and then, you know, we, we just tried to be very careful and to put information out that we felt confident that some thought and research um, and, and, you know, facts had gone into. We tried to stay away from rumors and only address rumors to the extent that we had pro could provide information to counteract the rumors that were out there, right? So a lot of CDC reporting at the time and also being very clear with the, the audience, right? That all of this information was unfolding and that for, to some extent, this was just the best information available. So how do you stay connected to the community, both finding out what's happening in the community yourself and finding the people to interview <laughs> when you can't go out, you know, when nobody's meeting. Yeah. Well, you know, our reporters still went out into the field. They went out with the boom mics. They went out with masks. People were still out and about, just not in the huge numbers um, that we had seen before. We knew there were a lot of frontline workers out there. And so, you know, we did what reporters and journalists do is we went out and found people to talk to you know, to keep that reporting going because there were people who had no choice, right? We, you know, we think about there was the stay at home mandate, but we forget that there was a certain group of people or groups of people who didn't have the choice to stay at home. They had to go. They were the grocery workers. They were the doctors. They were the police officers, right? A lot of our frontline service people were out there and, you know, there were still people out there providing childcare for people because, some people had no options. Did you have, as essential workers yourselves, did you have new problems to solve, new challenges to solve, to meet your staff where they were? You know, our, our biggest focus was on safety. And so we did things in our studios, like, you know, to clean, to make sure that we were cleaning the air and we put machines in place to disinfect the air. We, we limited our studios to one person. So for the handful of people that we still allowed to come into the studios, we gave them their dedicated studios to mit mitigate the overlap and the chance of spreading germs. So there were things like that that we had to address just from a practical standpoint. So for you personally, what was that time like? There was a lot of uncertainty. You know, it's, it's so interesting as a journalist, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of first responders, and, I, and again, I don't want to equate what we do as journalists to people who are on the front lines in the middle of disasters. I mean, there's a role for a journalist in that. Um, so I'm not creating equivalencies. I want to be clear about that. But in the way that your mindset shifts when you're in a crisis, right? And when you are responsible for doing a thing in a crisis, I think that's how we react. And so, the, you know, so it's not necessarily first and foremost about our safety. It's about what does the community need from us in this moment? And we shift into gear to do that. So for us, it's, you know, we're going through this personally, but imagine if we're going through this, what the community is going through and what questions they may have to you know, need answered. And so we tried to do that, but we also asked questions. So we're great at doing surveys here at WFAE. Um, we have more than 60,000 people in a database who have interacted with us. And so we sent surveys out to folks to ask, what did you need? What do you need to know? What information can we share? And we just tried to provide that information to people as best as we could. And then we watched social media. We saw all of the things that were being said. And we, when we saw threads that we could jump in and add some context to, we did that as well. Did you see your mission as a, as a journalism entity? Uh, did you see it change or did you see the emphasis shift? And if so, has it shifted back in any way? Not at all. I not, you know, not shifting in terms of the core of what we do. We, we are a news and information provider, and it just so happened during that time that a lot of the news and information was about COVID, but that's why we exist, right? We exist to make our communities better. We exist to make sure that they're as strong and as healthy as they could be, and we exist to make sure that essential information to how you live your life, that as best as we can with the resources available to us, that we can provide that. And so that's what we did during COVID.
did the need for your services make it easier for you to, or harder, or change your ability to um, to explain yourself to potential funders, individuals or organizations? You know, it's always that's always an interesting question for us, right? Because I I think um, or I know that we are an essential part. WFAE and local news in general is an essential part of healthy communities and a healthy democracy. And we live and breathe that every day. We see the impact of our work every day. Um, And in times like that, it has a different level of resonance. But that's who we are in. That's who we are day in and day out. And, you know, I'm sure when you're thinking COVID and what needs to be done, your first thought is not, well, let's go support the journalism institution because it's essential that people get the information that they need. And even though that's not people's first thought, I will say that they stuck with us. You know, this community stepped up in a major way to support us. Our funding was, you know, as strong as it ever was during COVID. You know, so it didn't become a a challenge about raising funds. People were still, the people who had the ability to give to us were still giving to us. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how did you, uh, your chief content officer, now your CEO, but chief content officer was really carrying a lot of the load. That role carries a lot of the load in this space. How did you protect your own emotional life and emotional space in that time? Uh, such a great question. Um, So I think this goes back to what I was alluding to when I talked about the first responders. There, you know, in this profession, I think we have a great ability, good or bad, to compartmentalize, right? To say, I have my own fear, I have my own anxiety, but I need to lock it away on this shelf because I have a job that needs to get done. And I can't let those things distract me from the job that needs to get done. And so that that was the focus was on this greater sense of purpose and mission, you know, and how could I serve not just myself and my own family, but how could I and the work that I do and the work that WFAE does be of service to the entire community and help keep them safe. Right. And I, and I think that sense of purpose drives me individually. I mean, I'm in this work because I feel a mission and a calling to make communities better. And that comes out of living in Hollywood, South Carolina, which, you know, to this day, I think the median income is $17,000, right? Like below poverty. Um, and, And seeing that disparity and feeling a sense of nobody's telling this story. And so if nobody tells this story, how does this get better? And so feeling that sense of, okay, I have to go tell these stories. And that drives me to this day that WFA exists because if we don't shed a light on some of the things that are happening, whether it's outside of COVID or within COVID, how does it get better? How do people get the resources they need? How do they get their problems solved? And so it's that sense of mission and purpose, you know, that that drives us past our own individual fear. I mean, it's no different then when our reporters are covering protests and they're out in the field and they're, they might directly be in harm's way and yet they push through that sense of concern for themselves because they know it's important to document, to explain so that the community can heal. Did you feel a pull or a push or a, um, did you feel torn between the community in Hollywood that you weren't able to visit? community here and work here? Yeah. Yeah. Because Charlotte is fortunate. They have a WFAE. Hollywood is not so fortunate. There is no entity that exists there that does the work that WFAE does here in Charlotte. And, you know, in Charlotte is also great because we're not alone in this work. We have wonderful partners through Q City Metro and La Noticia and others who are also serving this community with that sense of purpose. We have the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, which the library is actually a part of, where we team up collectively to do storytelling. And so this is a strong community for news and information. And and Hollywood, again, unfortunately, doesn't have anybody looking at it with that lens to say, how might the circumstances of people in Hollywood be 
in a time like COVID that might be different from the people in the larger Charleston area because the resources are so different. So what tools did you use to stay connected? You know, media, social media, um, the phone, <laughs> FaceTime. Yeah. You know, we were, so we had undertaken in partnership with the library actually, training around storytelling because we wanted, you know, one of our goals is to empower the community to tell its own story. And we had done a Queen City pod quest and we transitioned from the pod quest to an academy. And we did two boot camps to train people to tell stories physically in place before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, we shifted and we just did the rest of those. We did six more virtually over the course of that academy. Um, and we did a lot of that. We thought about how could we, so when there's so much anxiety, how could we as an organization kind of lift that if only for a moment, right? To give people a sense of connection. And so we started something called Songversations. And, you know, for the period that we did Songversations, like every time we did it, it was like noon in the middle of the week, you know, to give people a chance to come and hear some music. And for that moment, to forget everything else that was happening and just enjoy being together. What was Songversations? It was a virtual, it was a virtual interview and performance. And so we pulled together various um, artists from around the region and just had them come in. We actually, we had an interviewer talk to them about their art and their craft. And then we had them share some of the music and we streamed that on Facebook. So my father, always says there's no problems, there are only opportunities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, did the ways in which you had to come up with creative new things, has that changed what you're doing now? Yes, yeah, so I, I think, or I know this, going into COVID, if you would have talked about WFAE as having a large broadcast entity, being a hybrid workplace, you know, you probably would have been laughed out of the room, right? How can we do radio and not be in the studio? Um, and we proved we could do it. And so that persists, right? Most of our reporters, um, even some of our hosts are doing that work from home. And so what you hear on air is a reflection of a permanent shift in the way that we do our jobs as a result of the pandemic. You know, now we believe in the power of bringing people together, and that's why we do so much convening ourselves. So that part of it, we're happy to come back to some normalcy and create a space where people can come. We're actually sitting inside our Center for Civic and, Q and um, Community Engagement, which will also be the new home for WFAE's broadcast operations here in Uptown. And so, you know, right to the left of me is this engagement space. And so bringing people back together and seeing how much joy people derive from being back together, right, is, is the beauty of being able to at least return to some sense of normalcy in that regard. Yeah. Um, were there any particular um, tools that you personally used? Like, did you find yourself, did you find yourself feeling overwhelmed at any point? And was there anything you were able to use? to support you? You know, I did, interestingly enough, um, prior to COVID, a lot of the industry support for what we do meant that you had to pack a bag, jump on a flight, and go out and get into in the room with other people like you to talk about the challenges mm -hmm. and opportunities of the work. COVID, you know, if it had some silver linings, one was that all of that became virtual. And so there was a lot more, a lot more opportunities to talk and fellowship and think through challenges together without the disruption of travel. So I found a lot of support in those spaces where I have the guts to talk about what we were doing here at WFAE or hear other people talk about what they were doing or jump on smaller calls with a handful of people to talk about, well, how are you managing through this and how are you supporting your teams, right, through, through these efforts. And so, again, I think prior to that, people would have thought, well, we have to be in a room together to talk about those things. And that shift allowed us to, sh to demonstrate 
that we can connect even when we're not in the room together. Did the local journalism outlets collaborate? So there are, um, yes. So Charlotte Journalism Collaborative started pre-COVID and persists to this day. And we definitely, during COVID, looked at ways to, because our focus with the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative is largely affordable housing. But we did shift during that period, during the height of COVID, to talk more about what the community needed from us in that regard. And that, and what we do there is we collectively pool our resources to cover stories and share those stories across multiple outlets. The library houses all of the coverage that we do around those topics. So that persisted. And then we looked for other ways. So we worked closely with Q City Metro and La Noticia to talk about the financial um, toll of COVID-19 on communities of color. And so we had stories that we did here at WFAE that we then shared with those outlets in English and in Spanish to reach larger audiences during that time. And there were other collaborations like that over the course of you know the two years that were the height of COVID. Are there any types of stories or stories that you wish you'd either known about or wish you'd had the ability to cover but couldn't figure out how to cover in that time? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there, you know, what what we tried to do was to ask the community what were we missing? And so from that regard, you know, I feel confident that we covered a lot of the important topics. I mean, there were certainly things that I wish we would have covered earlier. Um, you know, we saw and, you know, and I'll just put an I statement on that. I saw the misinformation in the black community early. Um, I saw, you know, the impact on the black community early. And it took a while for the science to catch up, you know, and, and to start publicly talking about that, then, you know, I, which then precipitated a lot of reporting. I will give a shout out to our friends at Queen City Metro, which started calling that out very early in their coverage, that there's something going on here in the Black community that we need to pay attention to. So there are things like that where it's, you know, if we could have pivoted a little quickly, um, more quickly, we would have been a better service. I think the, what we saw was that people were struggling still for information and the need for the information as quickly as they could get it probably wasn't there, right? Because if you can recall during the height of vaccinations, people were like, where do I get these vaccinations? And then there were long lines for vaccinations. And so, you know, I wish we would have had more resources to help people pivot within the moment to say, hey, go here instead of here, right? You, you can get in over here. And those things weren't readily available from a resource perspective. And from an information perspective, it was just all over the place, right? And so, so many different sources and not all of them accurate. Um, so, you know, you, you don't want to think ahead to the next time, but I think it's the kind of thing that prepares us for what those needs will be should something like this ever happen to that extent again. Did the experience shine a light on any spaces where um, you felt you all needed to strengthen your relationships or strengthen your voice? You know, we're fortunate. We were fortunate in that when I came in 2017, we became very intentional about talking to the community about what it needed, right? Getting outside, and you know, you've you've been in the communication space, right? And and have worked alongside and as a journalist. And so you you know that traditional old school newsrooms can be very insular places. You know, we do journalism for ourselves and not for the communities that we serve. And WFAE, you know, has been very intentional for the last seven years about saying, we don't do this for ourselves. This is not about stroking our, our egos or doing journalism for other journalists or doing journalism for awards. This is really about what's the fundamental need of this community and how are we meeting that need? And how do we know we're meeting the need if we're not talking to them about what their need is and how well we're doing. And so as a result of that, you know, we've consistently done surveys over the years. We've done listening. And so, 
You know, we have a dedicated person on our team who goes out and talks to community groups. Now, she's not the only person, but we felt that that was important enough that we at least had one dedicated person, that that's the majority of their job, is to go out, sit down with groups and ask them, what do they need from us? What do they need of coverage? What do they need in their lives? What do they need in terms of the communities that they serve? And then we use that to inform our journalists about where the pulse of the community is on any specific topic. So with that in mind, we were already well prepared for adapting to, wait, the, the, sh the community's needs have shifted and not ignoring that shift, but being right in line with it. What do you see now that the pandemic is over? Do you see, do you think that Charlotte or Mecklenburg County is different? Do you see your journalism being received differently? Do you see any changes? I, you know, I don't know that the pandemic itself um, is, has affected the way our journalism is received. I think there are probably people who know us you know, and, and understand the range of what we do probably better as a result of the work we did during the pandemic and the partnerships we had and all the ways in which we tried to serve the community. I think that's certainly true. Um, you know, I think, I think the impact of the pandemic will continue to reverberate. I don't think we fully know what's different and what's shifted. We know that in crisis, the gap between those who have and those who have not gets wider. We see it in the schools where, you know, that, that education gap has only grown and that, you know, we haven't fully recovered there. Um, I'm not sure that we've recovered in our health institutions. You know, I'll give you an example that you know, I have a family member who has struggled with some mental health issues recently and the ability to get the necessary services feels impossible, right? That, that people just, there, there isn't the availability, there isn't the support. And I've heard, you know, in just asking questions and trying to understand what this challenge is, that that's gotten worse since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so there are things like that that we're hearing anecdotally that there hasn't been a comprehensive study to say, how have all our, of our institutions shifted, right? What's the long range impact? And then we know just physically, emotion, emotionally, mentally, that there's a toll that, that, in, that the pandemic has had that as individuals we're still dealing with. Mm -hmm. One of the things in addition to the pandemic itself, during the pandemic, um, you had the murder of George Floyd and a real spotlight on the experiences that the black community has with the police. Um, can you talk a little bit about covering that and what you've seen, what you observed here, and what you observed during the pandemic? So, you know, the- And if you're comfortable, feel free to talk about any of these topics more personal yeah. as well, it's up to you. So, you know, the, the Killing of George Floyd really, really highlighted the epidemic that has plagued communities of color, specifically black and brown communities, for my entire lifetime, right? You know, it's, I mean, you can go down the long list of names before and since George Floyd, where people feel like it's just a simple encounter that turned into a tragedy that could have been avoided if police and communities of color had better relationships. Um, and so I think what it highlighted because it was so pervasive and because it swept the country, but it highlighted for a lot of people who are not part of those communities is that wait, there's, there's, a, there's a crisis here that needs to be addressed and we need to think about these relationships differently. But for black and brown people, and, I, and I'll speak for myself, it's, well, now you're seeing what we've always seen and what we've always known, right? And I mean, think about the things that have happened since George Floyd and ask yourself, 
having experienced as a country the aftermath of George Floyd, how does this continue to happen? And why hasn't this gotten better, right? And, and again, we, we definitely see law enforcement doing the work in some places to try to build relationships, to try to change policing, to, to try to really become more community oriented. So this is no disparagement against them. This is really about talking about the systemic nature of racism and fear and bias that pervades and that is for us almost instinctual, that it's gonna take a lot more intentionality to break those cycles, right? Because it is that pervasive in terms of how we deal with certain people in this country. Did you find it easier to expand coverage on some of those systematic issues? Well, you know, so one of the things, because we do surveys, we had done a survey prior to George Floyd about what our community really cared about. Um, and, and this is a testament to Mecklenburg County and to Charlotte. And one of the reasons why I do this work in Charlotte, in fact, the reason I came back to Charlotte, which is when I left, so I was here in Charlotte in the early nineties and I left Charlotte and went to the Washington Post. I was at the Observer, I went to the Washington Post. But when I was leaving, I said I would always come back to Charlotte given the opportunity because what I found about Charlotte in the early 90s was that Charlotte was trying to have a different conversation than any place that I had ever lived in terms of race, in terms of equity. This is back to the 90s, right? So I remember Charlotte doing some really innovative things around housing and mixed income housing to try to disrupt the cycle of poverty and give people an opportunity. Um, you know, I know before that, you know, Charlotte had a long, long successful history with integration, right? And so of the school system um, before things started to roll back in that area. And so I, I always thought there was something special about this place where there was a different conversation that could happen. Um, and so I, I'm saying all of this because we did this survey prior to, and, and so I came back on the heels of the Chetty study where Charlotte had its 50 out of 50 that rallied the community. So I think this community was already ready for a change in how we look at equity and how we talk about equity and what does that even mean? Right. And how we look at some of these issues that are core to what Chetty found, which was housing, education, child care. Right. The list economic mobility, that list goes on and on for too long about the, you know, some of the factors that keep people stuck in poverty, in a cycle of poverty. And so when we did the survey, it shouldn't be of any surprise that the folks who took that survey of the top two issues that they were concerned about was poverty and economic mobility, right? And race and justice. Mm -hmm. And so George Floyd happens and as a, as a staff and our board gets a lot of credit too, we said, what can WFAE do differently? We had already been doing some of this work, but you know, we were trying to do it while we were trying to do everything else. And so the board said to me, what, what could you do to address this? And I was like, we could start a dedicated race and equity team. Right, where we make a commitment that these, these stories will still be told across our entire staff, but that we will have more focus on telling these stories as a regular part of the work and telling them in a different way. Because talking about race and equity is not just, you know, here's the latest study and here's the latest statistic and here are all of the things that give us challenges. It is also about normalizing our neighbors to, to each other, right? It's about not othering a black person, not othering somebody who's transgender, right? But really understanding the fullness of their experience and letting the larger community understand the fullness of that experience so that as a community, we progress. Because how do you create equity for what you don't understand if you're in a position to do so? Um, and so our board was like, great, you know, put together a proposal and go out and raise the money and, and they helped. But this community really rallied. And so we were able to raise a significant amount of money to launch our race and equity team. And that's the reason it exists today. And so you may have heard of our equilibrium live conversations and that's the outgrowth of that race and equity work. So it's going strong today. That's impressive. If you're comfortable speaking personally, um, 
were there things you learned about yourself or learned about uh, the community personally through this experience? Well, it's interesting. We, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, we had a conversation internally and I and the former CEO had a one-on-one -on -one conversation in which he wanted to open that conversation up to the, to the staff um, and have us all talk about what we were feeling in that moment. Because everybody, I, I would say there were a lot of people, you know, across race, across culture who felt what was happening very deeply and had a very emotional reaction to it. Um, and so we talked about, was it appropriate or not to try to have that as a company conversation? And the thing that it made me confront, it, you know, for myself and as part of the organization was that it's really hard to ask a person of color to put on display for the world that level of emotion and the intimacy with which you feel those things. And, and the description I gave to him was, it's like losing a relative and you're coming to the funeral to pay your condolences and you're asking me to console you, right? And so let's be careful not to do what feels performative. When people are, you know, when, people, when everybody's hurting, but when some people are hurting more than most. Right. And so and I and the other thing I shared is that people can't be vulnerable where they don't feel safe and workplaces aren't always the safest place for various reasons. Right. People there appropriately put up personal and professional boundaries in the workplace. And so, you know, that's the most you know, you're asking people to be their most intimate and the most vulnerable in a work where, in a place where they're intentional about putting up boundaries, right? So, so it was an interesting conversation. I don't think there's any right or wrong way. I don't, I don't think that the instinct was wrong, but I think it allowed us to have a conversation that was much more nuanced than the one that maybe was intended. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Okay. And now you are CEO. And now I'm CEO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are CEO. Do you think that um, well, what are the, some of the things, what are some of the, what's your guiding principle as you move forward as CEO? You know, really, my guiding principle is we do this work in service of this community and to help this community be stronger and be better than it is today. And that's, and when we say community, it is inclusive community. You know, if our neighbors are suffering, we're all suffering. And, and that's the, I, you know, that's the ideology. And so as we do our stories, I remind our editors to think about who is the most vulnerable person in this story? And are they represented here? Do we understand what this means to them. And if not, we have more work to do, right? And we don't always get that right. I mean, you know, reporters, like everybody else, they're working on deadlines, they have things to turn around, but we try to be very focused about making sure that we're inclusive and we're representative in our reporting and that we go beyond the reporting, right? This is, this is why I love WFAE and working in public media is because we don't have to just turn out a story and move on. We do a story, we have one hour on air where you can come in here an in-depth conversation, and then we bring people together for a convening. So people who represent different parts of that story can sit in the room together and have a conversation about what this really means and what the impact of this really is and walk away better informed than they were coming in. And so you know, that's the beauty of what we do. I like to tell people that we're bridge builders here at WFAE. Well, I want to respect your time. Um, so I want to just ask, is there anything either from your hand map or from your experience and your memories that you want to be sure you share that you haven't already shared? The one thing that I'd like to share is that the Charlotte community, and when, and when I say Charlotte, I'm talking Charlotte writ large, right? This region, 
the resilience of it is amazing and the humanity of it is impressive, right? And, and again, Charlotte has its challenges like a lot of other places, but the thing that draws me here and keeps me here is that I do think Charlotte is concerned about its wellness, you know, in a very inclusive way. And I, for the people who live here, it's something to be proud of. Is there a specific example of that that you could share? Well, I just think about, again, this economic mobility, and I know it's a difficult conversation. I know it's a difficult issue to tackle, but the fact that Charlotte has been unrelenting and attempting to address it. Right now, we do a lot of reporting about the ways in which maybe it's not, you know, as transparent and, you know, and how do we know about the outcomes? But the fact that there is this ongoing commitment to we need to solve this and an earnestness that I feel here that I just don't feel everywhere that I've been able to work and live professionally, you know, I, I think exists here in Charlotte. And so when I say that Charlotte, you know, has this, this level of humanity that I just don't see in other places. And, and again, I'm like, I'm not disparaging other places, right. but I feel it here in a way that I don't feel it elsewhere. And I, I get to be in a lot of rooms and talk to a lot of people and through the profession, get to scrutinize a lot of efforts. And, you know, and I think there's something special about Charlotte and, and our desire to not just be better, but to make sure that we all are better. I really appreciate it. I have one question that's just about my curiosity, which is the new um, series you're doing about joy. Yes. Was that inspired by your staff, the people here's memory of trying to come up with ways to find joy? Was it influenced by that in any way? No. <laughs> Just <was> curious. <laughs> no, but um, so, so since I came to WFAE, every year I've tried to have a theme of what, as a newsroom, you know, what are the big issues that are driving our community and how can we address that? So we started off with affordable housing. We made a year-long commitment to affordable housing. And... It, we got such response from the community and it has such an impact that we did a year two. And then through the pandemic, we said, OK, we're going to come to the other side of this at some point. And we need to look at how Charlotte is rebuilding. So for a year, we said we were going to do rebuilding Charlotte. Um, and then Corridors of Opportunity was the next year. And I thought about just over rebuilding and Corridors of Opportunity and now coming into an election cycle and dealing with all of the national and global events, specifically the war, that how heavy the news is gonna, has been and how heavy it's gonna be for us in the next year. And thought about the moments where I just wanna turn it all off and go inward and thought, what could WFAE do to pull people up? through all of that, right? Like, how can we just lift people a little more? And so that's where the Joy Series came from, right? That we know that in these times when everything feels heavy, we need to remember that there's resilience and there's joy. And if we could just share those things, then maybe we all can get through all of this a little bit easier. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much for your time. I really thank do. You.